This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Here we go! Listening to the Emerald Flow Show on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Welcome to episode 15 of the Emerald Flow Show. We're a podcast on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. You can follow us on Twitter at Emerald Flow Show, and we're on all the major podcasting apps. If you use Apple Podcasts, leave us a five star review. And if you're feeling generous, you can donate to the show at voicesofwrestling.com slash donate. I'm Gerard Detroit here with Paul Vosch. And Paul, I think it's safe to say this might be our most eagerly anticipated episode ever. Yeah, we've gotten multiple messages from multiple people asking us when the episode is coming out. So yeah, it's it's going to be a long one, that's for sure. Because there's just, I think if just one of the kind of, if just one of our promotions had, had have had the week that they've had recently, that would have been enough for like a big episode. But given that both of them at the same time had like, very very eventful weeks i think we're going to get very close to kind of the i mean i'm not going to want to promise it because obviously you as the listener can see how long we're going to go but i have a feeling we might get close to three hours here yeah definitely and i think it was probably the right move to wait until after the all japan show that i was i guess technically today because we're recording on the 18th because there is even more things that we can bitch and moan about uh (laughs) on that show and I so mean, we're let's just say we like one of these shows i think a lot more than the other one and let's just say if the budokan show hadn't gone as well as it did you probably would have just listened to a very special intro which you're not gonna be doing at this point you're just gonna have to just listen to the normal intro but i had a few special songs prepared that we might have used otherwise and maybe if we ever get to the point where both promotions shit the bed at the same time i will dig them out again <laughs> yes, uh, it's funny because now that we're a few days removed, I am uh, far less in the mood to like drink while recording this as well. <laughs> yeah, this was also almost opened with just us just opening alcoholic beverages, basically. But now we're just on water. <laughs> uh, so we start off with uh, no doubt probably what a lot of people want to hear. All Japan Summer Action Series 2022 that was on July 14th at cork and hall Uh, this drew 893 fans which was down a bit from some of their last cork and numbers although this this was uh unlike a lot of their other cork and shows which have been on holidays or on the weekend this is on a thursday night so it's down but i'm not sure you can call that like a disastrous number i think really what will be interesting will the numbers will be going moving ahead yeah it's I mean, we've been talking about for and about every midweek hurricane kind of is drawing a horrific number at the moment. So much so that I would actually argue that companies should probably just bite the bullet and basically say that it's half capacity and allow cheering. Because that's how much how many fans they're drawing anyway. 
so they might as well try and sell it as like a special attraction and maybe jack up the ticket price a bit and allow people to cheer. I mean, 893, I think, is a bit above half capacity of what they would allow there in there at the moment, I think. But still, like, it's just, yeah, it's it's not a great number for Triple Crown Defense, that's for sure, but it's better than other midweek Corrigan, so I'm kind of agnostic on the number overall. Yeah, for sure. And, like, it's just, I think, really, like, it's going to be, like, I think we'll talk about more of this later, but I think really what's going to happen with all Japan, it's going to be a longer term, like damage, I would say, or, yeah. or weakness coming out of the show instead of something that's necessarily going to happen all in like a month or two. So we start off the show. The first match was Suji Ishikawa, Takao Mori, and Ryo Inoue defeating the team of Masanobu Fuchi, Yoshitatsu, and Izanagi uh, in eight minutes and 32 seconds with Omori, Pinning Yoshitatsu after the Axe Bomber, which was a somewhat surprising uh, result, but that will make more sense a little later on. You know, I thought it was a perfectly fine opener. It was fun, and you know, I'm a mark, I'm a huge mark for Fuchi, so you know, I enjoyed this for what it was. Yeah, no, this was fine. I was definitely also surprised with the result, especially who got pinned here as well, because I mean, not even that the team with Inoue won. I think that already was very surprising, but that obviously made more sense later. But then also the fact that, like, I mean, it's Yoshitatsu that got pinned when Fuji was right there. And probably, like, if I would have expected his team to lose, I would have expected Fuji to lose and not Yoshitatsu. But I think maybe finally we can say that the Yoshitatsu verse is over and he's just, like, a lower cut guy in a promotion that doesn't really get special treatment anymore. Yeah, he's basically an opening match guy now. Yeah. Because he's on the opening match in the other show as well. So, second up, we had the debuting Cyrus defeating Black Mensa Ray in 1 minute and 51 seconds with a Vader Bomb, or it's called the Reverse Splash. I mean, it was short to the point, you know, Cyrus looked dominant, and, you know, I think he looks fine for what they expect of him. I don't know, Paul, like, do you think he's fine, or? Yeah, he was okay. I mean, it's, it's hard to really make a judgment based off of less than two minutes match time. He didn't embarrass himself, so that's for sure. I'm not sure really what his ceiling is, but he definitely doesn't seem like a complete kind of... He doesn't leave, seem like a complete stiff, let's put it that way. Like, he definitely has some potential to be like a good, like, big man Gaijin. So, no, just I guess it just kind of depends on if he uses the opportunities being given to him. Right. And then next up, we had Yuji Nagata and Hikaru Sato defeating Kento Miyahara and Rising Hayato in 12 minutes and 27 seconds with the Nagata Lock 4 from Nagata on Hayato. Uh, this was really good. I thought the Kento and Nagata uh, interactions were a lot of fun. And Hayato, like, he's just working really hard in every match he's in these days. Yeah. Uh, I was I mean, it made sense, obviously, that Nagata was winning here as well. I'm still kind of curious what direction they're going to go with Nagata, kind of long term. I mean, we're going to talk about the Odu tournament later as well. And there might be, I would expect him to go deep in that tournament as well, uh, with even the potential of winning it. I mean, we're going to talk about that more as well, but... Yeah, no, I mean, the match overall, like, it was fine. I was maybe a little bit disappointed because I just like every, all four men in this match, but I think it was just good overall as well. I mean, it was still mainly an undercard match, so obviously there's a ceiling for that. But, yeah, it was just solid. Right. And now here we're, here's where the fun begins. In the All-Asia Tag Team title match, Voodoo Murders, Minoru, and Toshizo defeated Hokuto Omori and Yusuke Kodama in 15 minutes and 30, 13 seconds when uh, Minoru pinned Kodama after the BDF, which is a diving foot stop. And the Total Eclipse team unfortunately failed in their V7 defense. Now Minoru and Toshizo are the champions. And uh, Toshizo is a double champion because he holds the Gaora TV title. I mean, this wasn't bad although it wasn't at the same level of other like hokuto and kodama uh, defenses of the all asia tag team title and there was obviously like a bunch of shenanigans in this although not as much as the main event so you know like three and a quarter stars like it's not setting your world on fire but it could have been a lot worse i suppose 
Yeah, it, it's actually after this match, or after the finish of this match, I started to get a sinking feeling about the result of the main event, which turned out to be true. So I think that kind of drags down my opinion of the match a little bit as well. Um, I would definitely say this was a bit on the weaker end in terms of kind of the Omori Kodama title defenses. So it's kind of a shame that this is how the reign ended as well. It was an okay match overall, but yeah, obviously there was like a bit of too many like voodoo murderous shenanigans for my taste as well. Uh, yeah, and the fact as well that it kind of tipped me off on the result of the main event really kind of left a sour taste in my mouth. And then from there, we had a uh, match that was building to the World Tag Team title match on the 18th. Strong Hearts team of T-Hawk, Shigehiro Irie, and L. Lindemann defeated the still unnamed unit of Shotaro Ashino, Ryuki Honda, and Seigo Tachibana in 10 minutes and 45 seconds when Irie pinned uh, Tachibana with a flying headbutt. Um, I think I'd hype myself up a little too much for this match. I thought it would be some like crazy, like, you know, go, go, go six man. It was still a good match, but it wasn't like this like sort of balls out sort of match that I thought they could have had or anything like that. But I guess it was still like fourth from the top, so they weren't going to try to steal the show there. Yeah, it definitely was kind of slower paced in terms of like, from what I've seen of like strong hard six man tags, to be honest. That was that was a bit of the weird part of the match, because especially like given the six man tags that we have seen from Strong Hearts in just all Japan, like not even talking about the matches that they've had in Glade. Uh it was still a really, really good match though, especially given its placement on the card. So yeah, I, I think it was just as you said, it was a bit of a victim of kind of high expectations. But I mean those expectations were also based on the work that Strong Hearts has put in recently. And I mean we've kind of not exactly this team obviously but almost these kind this kind of exact matchup is we've had that in the six man tag tournament and I thought that match was a lot better than this one. Yes it was, yeah. Yeah, so and the weird the weirdest part probably to me was that there was just a really heavy emphasis of an of on a Lindemann who's not an attack title match. So there was a bit of a weird decision. On at least Yes, five he like looked some of the best like one of the best guys in the match too, right? So, yeah and then yeah. he's just who knows when next when he's going to be in an all Japan show next? So yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, he's got like his charisma just sort of is overwhelming compared to a lot yeah. of the other guys, so it just sort of took over. Yeah, but I I, I mean, and, and I'm confused why they didn't just put like uh, what's his face again in there again. Uh, Onitsuka? Onitsuka, yeah. And he's really good. He's like a great prick that could have just like gotten beaten up. Yeah, I mean, again, they just had we just had this match in the six man tag tournament, so they could have just run that one back. Right. And then next up we had for the PWF World Junior Heavyweight title, Tiger Mask defeated Dan Tamer in 12 minutes and 21 seconds uh, via referee stoppage. Um, yeah, this was like passable. It wasn't that great. Dan looked a little shaky at times and you know, Tiger Mask is 51 years old. It wasn't like horrible or anything, but it just was sort of there. I don't, I don't really have much else to say. I don't know. I, I, I actually, I actually really liked the match. To be honest, like I don't oh, think really? it was a great match or anything, but it definitely exceeded my expectations because I thought this was just going to be Tiger Mask eating up Dan for like ten minutes and then pinning him or like submitting him. Uh, but I thought Tiger Mask actually gave Dan, Dan like a ton of offense here, like much, like a lot more than I expected. In, in some ways, Dan actually dominated the match. Actually. And that was just really interesting to see because I don't, that's like showed us a side of Dan that we haven't really seen so far. Because he's just really been kind of very much the like young boy underdog in most of his matches and especially recently in his feud with Savama. So it was just really interesting to see like what it actually looks like, what a Dan Tamara control sequence actually looks like. And yeah, he is still green. I would agree with that. But I think that's definitely he showed enough that I think there's a lot of potential there and there's something that he can build on and that hopefully he will be allowed to build on where he hope when now hopefully he kind of gets to move out of this like constant underdog stage and just gets to show a few more dominant performances like this. Yeah, I agree. I mean, Dan did get a lot in this match. I just didn't think the work was like that great, I guess. Um, so then we move on to something 
good in the company. Uh, Noyoya, Nomura, and Mizuki Watase of Real Blood defeated Yuma Aoyagi and Atsuki Aoyagi in 11 minutes and 7 seconds. And Nomura pinned Atsuki with the maximum. Uh, this was good. You could sort of tell that they brought the heat. Like, Nomura wasn't taking any shit from the Aoyagis. And, you know, they sort of... It was a little bit of a back and forth, but then sort of Real Blood sort of... Uh, powered through and were dominant in the end i thought so i thought it was good in continuing that feud and as we'll see in a bit uh set up some stuff for the uh, odo tournament mm -hmm. yeah I, I also really like this match uh this just felt like a proper heated feud as well uh, especially compared to uh, another match on the show that we're going to talk about next because that match did not feel heated at all uh, whereas here it just really felt like I mean, obviously, they've done a lot to kind of build up this Nayonomura and Yuma Aoyagi feud. But it's still, like, it really came across in the match as well that, like, there's, there's some hate between the two of them and they kind of just want to beat each other up. Uh, I also thought that they kind of played it smart as well because, obviously, this is just kind of the first match of what is probably going to be, like, a bit of a longer feud, hopefully. So uh, they didn't really go super all out here. They kind of saved some stuff for the next couple of matches that they're probably going to have. And yeah, as I said, like a really much more than supposed to be like a great match. This was really much more supposed to be a building block for something more down the line. Mm -hmm. And now the match you've all been waiting for, for the Triple Crown. Suwama defeated Jake Lee in 22 minutes and 26 seconds with the backdrop hold to win the Triple Crown. And Jake Lee fails in his first defense of the title after finally beating Kento for the first time in a Triple Crown match last month. And Suwama is the 67th Triple Crown champion. <laughs> yep. Uh, I... Uh, in my uh, review at voiceofwrestling.com, I just wrote, fuck this, dud. <laughs> That's um, being generous. Yeah, that might even be being generous. Uh, uh, so, I don't know. Like, there was some okay stuff in here. I thought Lee tried with what he was given. But, you know, Suwama went to, like, the outside early on, brought out a table, chairs, interference from Toshizo and Minoru. And Jake had this one... He hit the D4C on Suwama, and then straight out of an evil match in New Japan, the referee gets pulled out of the ring, and that leads to Suwama eventually being able to win. I mean, is this the worst Triple Crown match ever? Probably. I I'm going to have to dig into the archives to see if I can find anything worse, but literally off the top of my head, I can't think of a single match that is worse than this. Like, this was... Like, I would say even... Outside of the interference stuff, this was a bad match. I think Suwama was just really, like, not compelling at all here. He was just really boring whenever he was on offense. Like, he's basically just doing head... Like, he's basically just doing headlocks these days to Jake Lee. That was, like, the majority of his, like, non-cheating offense in this match. And Jake just isn't the right guy for this type of match. Like, yeah, you said he tried, but... Like, someone, like, what you need on, like, the babyface side to make this work is someone that can, like, show fire and do the fiery bite babyface comeback. And Jake is the worst. Like, that's literally the worst position you can put Jake Lee in is trying to be a fiery babyface on a comeback because he's <laughs> completely unable to do that. So this match, yeah, I don't know, it just completely fell apart for me. It was just horrendous. Like, neither man really was compelling for me in the match, and just the booking decision is just some of the worst shit I've seen in a long time out of a promotion. Uh, I mean, we've called Jake a geek many times, but this yes. is the ultimate geekification. Oh, no, Jake. he's absolutely a fucking 100% geek now and should never win the triple count again. Oh, wow. That, no, that, it's... I... No, he can't. Well, okay. Um, I guess... I know... We have Budokan implications in the um, in the show notes, but should we save that to one? Yeah, we get let's to the save, it for the save it for the Udo. Save it for the Okay. Yeah. So this, I think, this left a taste in a bad taste in just about everybody's mouth. I mean, there's a few contrarians out there, uh, uh, all hyped up, but whatever. I'm not going to pay attention to them. 
Uh, I think it I mean, none ruins... of them have also seen All Japan. Self-admittedly, have not seen All Japan in months, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, they just see Suwama with the red hair, and they're like, ooh, interesting. Um, so I think, like, and then this is like a huge momentum killer, too, right? Because yes. they had built up a lot of goodwill. People saying, oh, I'd watch All Japan, but I watched the Champion Carnival, and I really liked it. So, I mean, that's sort of at the window, I think. Yeah, and I mean, we've kind of been mentioning our anxieties about the way they were going with all of these kind of rapid turns and all of these things happening where it definitely felt like they were walking on a tightrope and they could fall off at any moment and I think now they've really just fallen off the tightrope and just collapsed to the ground basically because yes there was like other stuff on this show that was good but this is just such a bad decision that it just yeah it just takes the wind completely out of the promotion it just destroys any momentum that they could have had and it's just it's just kind of not really understandable like i don't really get why they've done this well i think some of it is panicking well maybe panicking is a strong word but they're trying to figure out something to run with budokan okay but, but i don't really like if we look at the drawing record the drawing record wasn't that bad especially compared to other promotions as well like maybe they maybe they just weren't looking at the big picture and were looking at Maybe they were only looking at their own numbers and thought they were bad and didn't try to put them into perspective with other promotions and seeing that relative to their means, they were actually still doing pretty well given the current situation in Japan. So that would be kind of the only explanation I can think of. But it's also not like Suwama has ever been like an amazing draw either, especially not heel Suwama. Uh, I don't think you can really argue Suwama has been a draw in six years at least yes yes and yeah but i mean especially on top of that like especially also like heel suwama is just not really like i don't think that's something that's gonna sell people on budokan where i mean we were talking about it it would have been just much more straightforward to just go and put yuma versus kento on top at budokan whereas now i mean we're gonna talk about it later i mean now there's one like not absolutely terrible option that they can do at Budokan and one pretty terrible option that they can do at Budokan and it's kind of just a completely unforced error as well. Definitely. Like I think that's probably the most frustrating thing about this whole thing that it's just a completely unforced error like it's not like like obviously you should never book yourself into a corner because wrestling's fake so like you can just do whatever you want Right. but here it just felt like they were just kind of drunkenly stumbling into it with like no sense of direction really right and it's not like someone got injured or something well i mean jake got injured obviously back in december but yeah that doesn't really affect they didn't no. have to go they still didn't have to go the route they did no because i mean like because if you do that and you change your plans and you just keep it on kento until budokan exactly because now now it's just weird that it's like we just had two like v0 defenses of the triple crown basically uh yeah the no, answer, we they decided to yeah no sorry no we didn't uh we just had drake on the v0 defense like losing right away like it's just well I, don't know, it's just... I think suwama might end up as a v0 as well yeah that's true <sighs> yeah pulling it's... a noah i mean hopefully hopefully he'll end up as a v0 defense because can you imagine the 50th anniversary show ending with voodoo murderers like on top like just yeah, no, think that's... about like just think about like how that looks that's a level of stupidity i don't even think they're possible no no i, I like I as bad as this is like <laughs> then i'm act even if noah does the best show ever i'm gonna i'm gonna get out the fucking burial theme for the show in that case <laughs> and that's that's a guarantee of this if budokan ends with heel suwama like raising up the title and like i don't know who the murderer is kento standing next to him <laughs> all right and we'll get to why kento might be joining the voodoo murders in a second here because we're moving on to uh summer action series on july 18th at the osaka surumi ryokuchi hanahaku memorial park or dogwood hall that's a mouthful they drew 597 fans which i think is a respectable number but i don't really know how many they had that set up for because this was a like a very large indoor venue with lots of windows yeah i so i tried to find like other promotions that have run this venue 
And the only ones I could find were two Freedom shows, one in 2019, one in 2017, both of which drew less than this. Okay. And this is also, I was kind of looking at it as well, to kind of excluding New Japan. Uh, this was the, uh, like, the second best drawing show in Osaka this year, as far as I could see. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's only a stardom show drew better than this. And all of those shows were in the Edeon Arena number two. So, okay. I mean, it is it is a pretty decent number. And it was a very interesting looking venue as well, I have to say. And But it is hard to say what the actual max capacity is because it there just seemed to be so much more room yep. for chairs everywhere. But again, like Freedoms ran it like pre-COVID and they sold less than that. So maybe that's just the maximum. That Maybe that's like 600 or something. It's like the maximum they're going to allow in that venue for some reason that makes sense yeah so to open the show we had hoguto Mori and yusuke kodama defeating yoshi tatsu and og shiba in six minutes and 42 seconds when omori used a single leg single leg crab hold on shiba um this was a fun little opener shiba looked great and uh, going against omori and kodama he looked really good and yoshi tatsu was perfectly acceptable and fun and didn't drag the match down it also was a nice little opening uh, match and in sort of backstage comments, Hokuto Omori and Yusuke Kodama will be taking some time off from uh, working as a tag team. They say they still like each other, but uh, we'll talk more about things because Omori is going to pursue some uh, things as a singles. <laughs> Why am I getting reminded of... Okay, and this is going to be a weird reference, but like, for some reason, the first thing I thought of when I heard of this was like the fucking storyline from Friends with Ross and Rachel going on a break. Especially because Kodama then also immediately like rebounded with Ashino and Co. So yeah, I don't know. It's it's definitely like rip my tag team of the year, I guess. And maybe they actually do will team up again, but it was definitely a very interesting way of splitting up the team. Yeah, they just do this move this stuff around with no build and no like final conclusion from their like previous alignments which is getting beginning to get really annoying. yeah yeah that, that's, there's definitely like a pattern here now because it's also just getting incredibly hard to figure out who's even in what faction anymore because obviously kodama is no longer in total eclipse but yeah i mean i don't know how much money you're leaving on the table but you can try to draw a show on like a you know total eclipse must disband if they lose this match type thing or something yeah true but When's the last time Noah? Uh, it's an awesome Noah. When's the last time All Japan even d has done something like that? Yeah, it's been a while. Because like the only thing I can think of was like the Evolution Dark Kingdom feud, where they basically had a match that if they lose, Dark Kingdom had to leave All Japan. But it's not like Dark Kingdom disbanded because of that. So like, even trying to think when All Japan has ever had a Unit Must Disband match. I can't even think right. of anything. Yeah, but it's still something you could do. It, it is something. It is definitely something you can do. Yeah, yeah. But I also have a feeling that's just kind of going to peter out instead because that's just... Or it's just going to continue in like various revived zombie forms forever until everyone involved is like retired. Well, Hokuto and Jake are still teaming later on, so it's tech... I don't think Total Eclipse is technically dead. <laughs> I mean, Kuma Arashi is also still wearing Total Eclipse tights, so... Yeah. Well, so we'll move on since you mentioned him. The next match was Kuma Arashi defeating Black Mensa Ray in 4 minutes and 39 seconds with the diving senten from the top rope. It was nice to see Kuma back. This was fun. I mean, it was a comedy match too. They sort of brawled on the outside and fought on like a staircase ramp in the venue. And then, you know, Arashi got the win. Uh, I sort of realized that we're not seeing like Kuma Doi because they've basically been cycled out in... <laughs> favor of like Minoru Toshizu Nagata and Tiger Mask basically it seems like yeah which is a shame now we know why they, they didn't sign contracts this was like a long term plan I guess uh yeah I mean I would definitely prefer to have Kumodoi over like most of Voodoo Murderers I'm not gonna lie uh yeah I really only saw the beginning of this match to be honest because I uh, needed to go to the toilet and by the time I came back it was already over <laughs> No, it was simple fun, and it was funny because when Kuma came out, there was a guy in the crowd 
wearing a tiger mask mask and a new japan lion mark shirt and kuma just points at him like what are you doing here type thing <laughs> so i got a good chuckle out of that uh but yeah i mean it was fun like nothing like you know undercard fun match getting him a win even though god knows when we'll see him next you know hopefully sooner rather than later maybe he'll get a he'll probably get booked on the budokan because they need to fill out their undercard yeah i mean i would hope so uh because would be kind of would be kind of a shame if because kumadoi have been working hard so it would be kind of a shame if they've been like more or less completely cycled out in the next match all japan where the big boys play it's Jake Lee, Takao Mori, and Cyrus defeating Shuji Ishikawa, Kohei Sato, and Ren Ayabe in 10 minutes and 35 seconds with a uh, Vader bomb from Cyrus on Ayabe. Uh, I really like this match. It was fun for what it was. It's like six very large men fighting each other. I thought Shuji really sold for Cyrus's strikes here. Just sound like they were like devastating. And so, which said to me, like, if, if the Booker man is selling for the new foreigner, they want to get him over. Yeah. No, definitely. It seems like Cyrus is like the new Ishikawa project. So I, I'm actually wondering. It's actually, I haven't looked at. Uh, let me take a quick look at the brackets. Oh yeah, they actually. Oh yeah, they're facing each other yeah. in the first. So I guess then Cyrus is gonna win that, right? Like th- I think that's gonna me. be that's gonna be the real proof if like yeah. Ishikawa wants to put him over. Because if he lets him, if he. Like if Cyrus beats Ishikawa and the Odu, I think that's that's the very clear sign that they want to do something with him. Yeah, so that that's the thing to look out for. What do you think of the match? Uh, yeah, as I said, the match was fun. Just six large men just fighting each other, which is really something you can only get in all Japan these days. So it was fun for what it was. What I found weird though was Jake just coming off of losing the triple crown, kind of just teaming with two random guys that are not in his faction and then him also not getting the pin in the match was I don't know, was a little weird to me because again, that's like, again made me question, so like, does Total Eclipse still exist? Because Kumarashi just wore the Total Eclipse tights, but then Jake doesn't team with Total Eclipse Yeah, it doesn't make any sense at all No, it doesn't (laughs) (laughs) Um so in the next match, we had Yuma and Atsuki Aoyagi teaming with the returning Zeus and the bodyguard, and they defeated Yuji Nagata, Dan Tamara, Karasato, and Ryo Inoue in 14 minutes and 29 seconds with a referee stoppage when bodyguard put Inoue in the camel clutch. To my knowledge, and a quick glance at cage mats, this is the first time that Nagata has ever mixed it up with Zeus and bodyguard, which was cool to see. I actually thought this was a lot of fun. And uh, Inoue got to kick out of quite a bit of, of stuff from the bodyguard towards the end before he got put in that camel clutch, you know, and they're really starting to move him up um, the card because, oh, we forgot to mention, Takao Mori came out on the Cork and Hall show to challenge um, uh, Minoru and Toshizo for the All Asia tag title. So he's going to team with um, Ryo Inoue to do that on July 29th at Shinkiba First Ring. So they're sort of giving, uh, in a way, a lot of rub for some guy only six months in right now. Mm-hmm. No, they definitely say a lot in him. And, I mean, rightfully so, because he's really talented. And it is also nice to see that all Japan is just willing to like give people these kinds of opportunities like so quickly as well, if they believe in them. Um, obviously, I don't expect them to win, but I think it's nice to see, nonetheless, like just after six months that he's getting this opportunity. Uh, I thought the match, yeah, as I said, like the match was a lot of fun. Um, it's what I, I wasn't really a fan of was the fact that Yuma just kind of feels like an afterthought at the moment. Like yep. outside I was going to say, like, feud. I thought him and Atsuki looked great and were sort of the glue that held the match together, but they're not really doing much else. No, yeah, they, they definitely were like like glue guys in the match, but they also weren't really like the focus of the match either. Because I think the focus on their team side was very much more on, like Zeus and the bodyguard which makes sense to a degree because they're in osaka i mean on the topic of zeus though he's looking a lot leaner these days like i haven't really kept up with osaka pro but it was kind of like interesting to see that like he has slimmed down like he looks he's looking a lot trimmer now than he did at the end of his all japan run well paul you buried the lead what else was going on with zeus there oh you mean his haircut 
Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's no, that, that was that was the other thing that I immediately noticed. I was like this, because at first I was like, "Oh, he's looking a lot slimmer." I was like, "Wait a minute, where's his hair?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's had his hair really short before, but I, I don't think ever bald like that. No, yeah, yeah, it's maybe maybe he just finally decided to just give up the fight against like time and just decide. To well, just you know, it was it was hot in uh, Osaka. It was thirty two degrees out. Uh, during that show, I checked the weather in Osaka and I saw like Yuma had that sort of like handheld fan that he brought out to the <laughs> ring. So maybe Zeus just said, fuck it, it's really hot summer in Osaka this year. So he uh, decided to get rid of the hair. Yeah, maybe, maybe I should consider that as well, given that we might get like 35 or 36 here soon. So that's going to be fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, good match, but just like what's going on. And um, did you think like, I know it, We'll get into this a little later, but it just feels like right now Nagata is sort of just a mid-card guy too. Do you think that's going to last long? See, you're going to talk about that probably more when we get to the Udo tournament. Like, I yeah. don't feel he's the mid-card guy. Um, I mean, it was curious that he was on the losing side in this match. <laughs> but I do have certain fears on what they might do with him going forward and maybe if they don't do that and I probably will agree with you that they see him as more of a mid card guy which is very interesting and it also means that like it also doesn't seem like New Japan is protecting him at all in the booking Tiger Mask is more protected yeah, than Tiger Nagata. Mask is way more protected than Nagata is but Tiger Mask is also literally only in there for title matches like he's not doing yeah. any multi mans at all like he's literally just comes in has a title defense and leaves and doesn't do anything else that's true too uh, so the next match was Suwama and Taru defeating Kento Miyahara and Rising Hayato in 13 minutes and 30 seconds. I mean, this had... Oh, yeah, when Suwama pinned Miyahara with the backdrop. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big part of the match. I mean, once again, Hayato is given like shit and he tries to like work the damn hardest he can. Um I will say I thought Taru bumped here more than I suspected. I thought he would. I'll give him credit for that. But he also showed. But he also stole Kendo Cash on spot. Yes, yes. Like lots of brawling around in the ring and chairs and tables, and then the powder got thrown by Taru, and that allowed Suwama to pin um, uh, Miyahara. Now. This was certainly not the worst match you've ever seen or anything like that. And like I said, I thought Hayato looked good. I thought actually some of the Kento versus Suwama stuff was good. But obviously the shenanigans from Voodoo Murders are overpowering and sort of put a hard ceiling on how good a match this was. Although I suppose it could always get more egregious. And then after the match, Suwama and Taru got on the mic. Basically Suwama said, I'm boycotting the Royal Road slash Odo tournament. Taru's going to take my place. And if Tar, although this hasn't made it been made official yet, and the the site still lists Suwama, and then Taru says, you know, if I beat you, Kento, you have to rejoin Voodoo Murders because once upon a time, a very young Kento Miyahara was a member of Voodoo Murders for a little bit there. So I don't know. This is kind of scary on some in, on many levels. But it can't like okay. I mean, they just put. Look, I know this sounds weird given that we just shed on them and like they just put the title on Suwama, but. They... They can't be that stupid, right? Like they just like that would be well, a monumentally dumb thing. <laughs> I think if Kento goes into the Voodoo Murders, I think it's clear who wins the Odo tournament. Yeah, no, obviously, it's obviously Taru, uh, and Taru then turns face and faces Suwama in the main event <laughs> of Budokan and wins the Triple Crown. And I'm just gonna, I don't know, burn down Budokan. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was going to say Nagata, I think. Wins no, the, yes, obviously, uh, that's Nagata. It, it, which, Kento uh, does turn, but yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. so monumentally stupid. It's like Steve Austin turning stupid, Yes, given how important Kento is to the company, right? Yes, like given the amount of merch he sells. Like, like you've seen the like autograph lines he has like when he was Triple Crown Champ. Like he's just, he's literally their cash cow. Like they have to rely on him to draw on shows. Like he can't do that as a heel. <laughs> Well, and I was also going to say, and this is just by like looking at the crowd, he brings in most of their female fan base because yes. they're all decked out in Kento gear. Yes. I mean, the Aoyagis have a bit of a female fan base, and so does Jake, but Kento clearly has the largest one. Yeah. No, like that's just like that. This might legitimately be a business-ending decision 
if they decide <laughs> to put Kento into Voodoo Murderers, because they might just completely kill their business instantly by doing that. Yes, it would be bad. I think it's just sort of to hype things up. Yeah, no, I, like, I my I gut is like, it. okay, if we're taking Suwama out of that match, having already advertised it for the Cork and Hall, you got to put like something with a stipulation yeah. in. And as good of a draw as Kento is, like he can't draw against Taro because he's Taro. Right? Well, Taro. Yeah. Well, you know, up until this angle, I actually thought that that Suwama versus Kento match was going to end in a DQ and then Kento was going to go through. But I guess they won't even do that. No, I mean now, so what, like now Kento just like has to win. Yeah. Which is going to be interesting if he can get Taro up for the shutdown suplex. Well, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, he probably just wins it with the the blackout knee. Oh yeah. Um, which he'll do to because, larger opponents. Yeah, sometimes. because I'm not sure he can lock his arms around Taro because Taro might be a bit too wide for that. Yeah. Oh, I don't even know if Taro could take that bump. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he can jump that high. Um. So next up, we had another defense of the PWF World Junior Heavyweight Title. Tiger Mask defeated Izanagi in 12 minutes and 36 seconds with the Tiger Suplex. Hold. I thought this match was uh, better than the match against Dan. I mean, it was a pretty good match considering that Izanagi is 46 years old and Tiger Mask is 51. You know, Izanagi did his little thing where he tried to get a lot of roll-ups and he got a couple of near falls. He actually took quite a bit of offense from Tiger Mask before Tiger Mask finally put him away with the um, Tiger Suplex hold, including that chicken wing face lock suplex, which I always thought was so cool. Um, so yeah, it was a good little match between those guys. Um, yeah, it was fine. Um, didn't really have super high expectations coming into this match, and they were mostly met, I suppose. To me, Tiger Mask is just kind of really limited at this stage, and he always was one of the weaker workers of all of the Tiger Masks, so that isn't really helping him. And Izanagi is really, really solid, but he's also not a miracle worker either, so it just kind of ended up being an okay match. I mean, this match really just happens happened to like bolster Tiger Mask's defense record before he loses yeah. the belt again. Paul, when was the last time one of uh, All Japan's uh, wrestlers from Osaka actually won in Osaka? Wrestler from Osaka actually won in Osaka. I mean, this show, because the bodyguard won. Right, but I mean in a big match. Oh, in a big match. Probably yeah. when Zeus won the Triple Crown. Yeah, that, and that was four years ago this yeah. month, actually. Because when, he, Zeus when he lost... won the baby. Yes, yes, he, he, yes, he, yeah, he held the baby up. Because uh, ever since then, he had several title shots in Osaka and has lost. Yeah. And I think Izanagi's also had more than one junior title shot and lost in Osaka as well. So this is some WWE level stuff here <laughs> going on in Osaka. Yeah, no wonder they can't fill uh, ED on Arena number one. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And then after the match, as we said, Hokuto wanted to go uh, pursue some stuff as a singles, and he challenged Tiger Mask. Um, there was no date given, so I assume this happens during the Royal World Tournament because Hokuto's not in it. Yeah, I mean, that would make sense. Um, obviously, then he's going to lose if it's not at the Budokan, because obviously yep. I very highly doubt that Tiger Mass is going to lose this belt before Budokan. And I mean, that pretty much just leaves Atsuki, right? Like, it's Atsuki right. or, like, I Hayato. Mean, that's, well, I think it's going to be Atsuki. That's what I yeah. sort of assumed this was all building to. Even though I think just keeping it on Sato and having Atsuki beat him at the Budokan would have been perfectly fine. Yep. But what are you going to do? I mean, but then again, like, I don't know, like, it feels weird what they're doing with the Iyoyagi brothers right now. So that's why I'm, like, less confident now that it's going to be Atsuki. Right. Yep. And they might just go and have Sato have a rematch with Tiger Mask as well. Oh, God. Yeah. And then in the main event, uh, Shotaro Ashino and Ryuki Honda with the tag team with no name defeated T-Hawk and Shigahiro Irie of Strong Hearts in 20 minutes and 56 seconds when uh, Ashino pinned Irie with a T-Bone suplex and they made their first successful defense of the titles. I was pretty confident they were going to win, especially once uh, Great announced that they were bringing in their own tag titles very soon. I figured they weren't going to have their guys win tag titles outside the company. So, yep. I thought this was like the best match over these two All Japan shows. It was really good. I went four stars. Um, 
if I had one critique to make of it, I just felt that Strong Hearts never felt like they were like gonna win this. I would have preferred maybe a few more like dramatic near falls where it looked like Strong Hearts was gonna win. And I think that Ashino and Honda are very good tag team, but they don't quite like if you look at them compared to like T Hawk and Irie, they don't quite have that level of chemistry and constant like teamwork that uh, like a much more seasoned team has. Yeah, I agree. I wasn't quite as high on the match, so I I didn't think like I didn't like it on like a four star level, but I still thought it was really good kind of first title defense uh, for the team. Uh, as you said, like that was my problem as well, where I just didn't really ever feel that Erie or T Hawk were ever in like a serious chance of like winning the team. Like there wasn't really any near fall that I that they had that I actually bit into that it was gonna be the finish. Uh, but it was just really good solid work. Like bo- like all four guys are like really really good. So uh, and it showed in this match as well. Maybe one other critique that I had as well is that. Honda is like Honda is starting to be like really really good on offense like that lariat that he hit on Erie that was great but obviously because he is the younger guy right now he is kind of the guy that does all the selling which to me is a little weird given that he is kind of the bigger horse guy so him being the guy that does the selling like I don't think that is the right role like he should probably be more the guy that comes in on the hot tag uh after Ashino maybe takes the heat if they're gonna be kind of more in that baby face role. So like that might be my only critique of the match. And maybe that will also help like if like Honda isn't the guy like selling. Maybe that will also then like and if they are just more on offense overall in the match, that might also then help Ashino and Honda develop that chemistry that you're talking about. Right. Uh overall I would say it was a good show. I mean it certainly like wash the bad tastes out of my mouth that was the cork and hall even with that sort of suit whole like voodoo murders angle and with kento but we'll yeah, see it definitely flew uh, by i have to say that like it, like it didn't yeah. drag at all um no it was a much easier watch than the cork and uh, just a couple notes before we get the odo tournament on july 24th at 2aw square we got real blood uh no more and watase versus jake and hokuto and then in singles matches that are being billed as only possible finals matchup in the Odo tournament because of the bracket setup. We've got Yuma versus Yoshitatsu, Kento versus Atsuki, and Honda versus Ishikawa, and uh, Dan Tamara versus Ren Ayabe. I think the winners in all of those are pretty obvious. Yeah. And then at July 29th on Shinkiba first ring, you have the All Asia tag team title match with Minoru and Toshizo versus Takao Amore and Ryo Inoue, and Ashino and Honda versus Suwama and Kono. Do you think this could be setting up uh, a, a tag title match down the line? Do you think Suwama's going to be a five crown king heading into Budokan? I think it could set up a tag title match. I mean, if we're going to get an Ashin on Honda title defense against Voodoo Murderers, I would maybe expect it more to be like Taru and Kono. Uh, yeah. Challenging for, like, I could actually see that. That would be not great, but I could see that be like the Budokan match, which. Ugh. But yeah. Okay, so now we go to the Odo tournament. On the left side of the bracket in the first round, it's Suwama versus Kento Miyahara and Suji Ishikawa versus Cyrus, Shotaro Ishino versus Dan Tamara, and Yuji Nagata versus Yoshitatsu. On the right side of the bracket, it's Jake Lee versus Ren Ayabe, Atsuki Aoyagi versus Takuya Nomura, uh, Takao Mori versus Ryuki Honda, and Yuma Aoyagi versus Naoya Nomura. Paul, what do you think of the lineup overall, regardless of the booking? I think the lineup overall is really good. It's probably one of the stronger lineups that they've had for this tournament. And I mean, that's also because I think in the past, my criticism of this tournament has been that they haven't really built any like matchups for the tournament. Whereas I think in this case, there actually are like plenty of like potential, like really good matchups that, that they have been building to. Um, yeah, and I think just overall as well, like the lineup of talents in there, like it's a really interesting mix of like all Japan regulars as well as kind of just people that are like maybe just showing up like less regularly as well. Uh, and I just think like like pretty much everyone like is gonna work hard as well. And I think there's really like a lot of potentially great matches in here. 
So on the left side of the bracket, it's either Kento or Yuji Nagata going to those yes. finals. Yes. And assuming they don't do something in monumentally stupid, which is, in my opinion, even stupider than putting the triple crown on Suwama, uh, actually turning Kento heel. Um, it's going to be Yuji Nagata versus uh, Kento in the semifinals at Korokin on August 20th. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, you assume Kento wins that? I want to say yes. Because, look, they give Nagata wins over Yoshitatsu, and assuming, obviously, Ashino beats Tamara, Nagata will be beating Ashino. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it could also be that, like, the way this leads up to that, Nagata's actually going to be in a title match at Bud in the tag title match at Budokan. Which, actually, that's, yes. that's a solution that I'm actually not against. But I am also still afraid, given the way that they're booking, where they're like, oh, we need to go back to all reliable Suwama, uh, that they might just think that putting a New Japan guy in the title match at Budokan is their best shot at drawing a good number, which I think is would be a disastrous decision. Like, I think that would just be... That's not as stupid as turning Kento heel, but it's also still... Because whoever is in that title match then needs to win, and then just the... Just the, like... Just how that look Like, just the kind of... Like impression, like what impression does that give you of all Japan if their 50th anniversary show ends with an outsider winning their title as a baby or a face? heel, or a heel winning? Yeah, like both of those are yeah, really that's... stupid. But in a way, yeah. like in that way, it's actually like yeah, heel winning is really bad. But that would actually be less bad than like at least Suwama is an all Japan guy through and through. Beating a new Japan guy in the main event. Yeah, whereas like an outsider coming in and just beating an all Japan guy at the 50th anniversary show to win the title. Like a guy that has done, has done nothing in New Japan in like five years. Like that's just not good, not a great look at all. No, no. So, and then I think the right side of the bracket is very interesting because it's pretty much guaranteed that we're going to get a Takuya no More versus Jake Lee match in the quarterfinals. That's going to be cool. And I assume Jake wins? Probably, unless they want to run Nomura versus Nomura in the semis. Yeah. Well, right, and I was going to get to that. Nomura beats Yuma in the first round, right? Yeah. That's where I sort of thinking, because that keeps the feud going. Yes, yes, because if Yuma wins, then the feud is just over. Like that. Right. I don't think there's really a point in doing that, and yeah. Now, does... Does Jake does Nomura beat Jake? And then you have Kento beat Nomura in the finals? I could see that because again, that, that's I mean it is a fresh matchup, so you could run with that one. You could also It'll be play. actually almost three years since the last time that Nomura and Kento had a singles match. Yeah, yeah. I mean really the only other thing I could see happening as well is that they do actually end up going with Yuma versus Suwama as well. So, well, I mean, that's in many ways the least worst option. Yes. I was going to say, it's the least worst option because you crown a new young champion at the Budokan. Yeah. And you can, for example, you don't need to run like Kento versus Yuma again because you can actually run Nagata versus Yuma in the, in the main event. And just yeah. like Because that's not really like a big match that you need to like save for like another time. No. Because that's that would be maybe my issue with doing Kento versus, Nam Kento versus like Nerea Nomura. Because you might want to save that for something else as well if you actually think that yeah. Nomura has become a regular again. So here is my... Now, this is not likely to happen, but here's my preferred uh, order of a possible Budokan at main events. Uh, number one, Yuma versus Suwama. Mm -hmm. Number two, I don't see many people talking about this, Ashino versus Suwama, because there's the history. <laughs> yeah, but then and Ashino number... would have to lose the tag titles right 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 but gonna... these are just what i think yeah. is the least worst out of the situation that they they put themselves in and then kento versus suwama yeah and then next i guess jake versus suwama yeah well i might even slot jake above ashino into third because then you can at least get some vengeance for jake what if they just go completely crazy and run suwama versus noe and amora that would rule I mean, no more finally. <laughs> that would be in, that would be absolutely like just imagine the turnaround like within like 
half a year of him leaving and then him main eventing yeah. Budokan. But I don't think that will happen. That would be insane. Yeah, so I'm still I'm still leaning towards Kenta winning this. Yeah, can, can, like it just feels like the safest option. Yeah, it just again like it's actually like the fact that they're running this whole and they've already Kento started building up Suwama versus yeah. Kento. They've already started building up the match. Yeah, exactly, Kento exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like this whole angle with like Kento being may, might be forced to join Voodoo Murderers to me is kind of a tip off that like he's that that's the match that they're building to. If Nomura goes into the finals of this tournament, is he signing a contract in January? Probably. I mean, I would hope so. I mean, it somewhat depends kind of what type of match then they're running at, like, Budokan with him and Aoyagi yeah. there. Because maybe, maybe this is also just leading up to, like, I don't know, like, loser leaves All Japan Forever match, and it's just, like, him getting, like, a proper end of his All Japan run, but... I hope it's the opposite and it's actually just the start of a second yeah. run. Exactly. So hopefully. So that's all Japan. Uh, it's a bit of a mess right now. Um, I don't know, Paul, did you have any other feelings on this? Like, and oh, sorry, I just wanted to say, like, I don't think this kills the company dead in like two months. But what I think it's a, the problem is that what it does is just kicks the can down the road and you spend less you spend much longer trying to develop all of the younger talent you've geekified jake and you know i mean i would hope that yuma wins a triple crown sometime in like 2023 because what else are we doing here right yeah no it's just they seem to be on a good trajectory especially like that they were finally willing to like push younger guys by like having yuma win win the champion carnival and having Honda win the tag titles and then it just yeah as you said it just kind of almost resets the promo like it almost sets the promotion back like two three years I think yeah well maybe a year yeah. three might be dramatic I don't know yeah. uh, but definitely at least a year like like see what like the model to me was New Japan's elevation of Okada but these other companies have decided to just bring like in Noah too go with the old guys yeah i mean to be fair noah did do it a little bit when they first put the title on kaito it's just yeah right yeah because that that, that they... was like the most that was like the only other time i can think of a promotion actually attempting something like the rainmaker shock again yeah but then they moved away from it yeah and yeah i mean we'll, we'll talk about direction. that in great detail yeah, yeah. Okay, so before we get into pro wrestling, Noah, just a message here from HelloFresh. And so what is HelloFresh? With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Choose from 55 plus weekly opt-ins featuring Pre-portioned high-quality ingredients picked at peak ripeness. HelloFresh delivers fresh quality produce from the farm to your door in less than a week. Select meals from the Taste of Summer series that are sure to become everyone's new favorites like the Old Bay Shrimp and Sausage Boil and family-style grilled steak lettuce wraps. Um, foolproof step-by-step -step recipes mean a joyful cooking experience and stress-free summer plus HelloFresh cuts back on the time spent in the kitchen with meals around 30 minutes or less. And definitely during the summer, I find myself way more apt to like not want to cook and spend the time cooking a big long meal. I don't know, Paul, do you ever get that feeling? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And it's especially when it's like as hot as it is right now. It's just like oh, you need to go like going out right now can actually be a health hazard in like 36 degrees. So uh, it is actually just much better to just have all of that stuff just delivered right to your doorstep and you can just make a nice, easy summer meal right at home and you don't need to go out into the summer heat. Right. So you can go to HelloFresh.com slash V-O-W-16, all one word, and use the code V-O-W-16 for 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free gifts. That's HelloFresh.com slash V-O-W-16 and use code V-O-W-16 for 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free gifts. So now we move on to Pro Wrestling Noah and I think overall a more positive outlook uh, to things. 
Would you say so, Paul? Yes, a bit of a flip on how we've talked about both of these promotions recently. <laughs> Definitely. They kind of switch positions right? now. <laughs> they can never be both good at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> would, have been, would have been nice. <laughs> they kind of were at the beginning and, of the year. <laughs> yeah. And so with we go to NOAA Destination 2022 on July 16th at the Nippon Budokan. That drew uh, 3,215 fans. That's only like what 34 more than January or something like that. Yeah. So that's not good, especially given all the reports that uh, Cyberfight was unimpressed with that number in January. Yeah. No, it's definitely. It's, I would also maybe say that most likely restrictions are gonna be less as well. So it's. I mean, I'm also struggling to call it an outright bad number just looking at like other shows at the Budokan so it's definitely not a good number like I'm probably just settling that it's just just okay but that's again given that Cyberfight doesn't really seem to be happy with some of these numbers definitely isn't a great sign either and hopefully maybe with some of the stuff that they've done on the show that will help them like course correct and like improve these numbers going forward yeah, the worst thing they can do right now is being like, oh, shit, let's go with Fujita and have him squash. I mean, if, if you just want to tank your numbers completely, you just, I don't know, you like run Fujita versus Nakajima at the Budokan in January. I will say that they spared no expense for the uh, set on this show either. No, no, I mean, that there's, that if there's one thing you cannot blame, you can not, not accuse Noah of, it's that they have shitty productions because they probably have the best productions in all of Japan, like, think i might actually put them ahead of new japan yes definitely the 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 sets are more impressive yeah. for sure uh so the first match was shuji kondo tadasuke hajime ohara and hiroki of congo they defeated daisuke harada atsushi katoga yohei and extreme tiger in 11 minutes and 17 seconds when kondo pinned harada with the king kong lariat uh, Kondo getting a big win over someone like Harada will make more sense later on in the show. I thought this was a really good opener. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, really yeah. good Noah Jr. opener. You know what I what I actually thought of in this match, which I thought was kind of weird? It's the fact that Kondo is a junior in Noah and a heavyweight in all Japan, which seems backwards given the way both promotions normally operate. <laughs> Kondo just won the junior title like a couple years ago in all japan yeah but he beat yuma in a singles match right yes so i would true. say I he's a heavy like so that tells me that all japan now considers him a heavyweight i guess so yeah it's weird yeah but it's also so. it's also like interesting that like all of a sudden like in 2022 like half the like relatively large promotions in japan decide you know what it's time it's time to push shuji kondo like i'm not against it it's just <laughs> interesting that like just in a very rapid succession, like Dragon Gate, All Japan, and Noah all decide to push Kondo. Yeah. Well, Kondo doesn't have any more All Japan dates coming up, at least for the next, until maybe Budokan or something. Yeah. So it's, it's probably because, because he's, I, gonna he's be obviously going to be busy. Noah, yeah. yeah. And is he main eventing Kobe World? Uh, no, he lost the title match, right? Oh, right, yeah. right. Sorry, I'm mistaken. But that's the one that ended in a no contest. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, maybe... Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to have, I might actually join the kind of preview for Kobe World, the written one at the very least. So there's definitely something coming up uh, for that on the website as well and on the podcast as well. But yeah, it, it, there might be something in the works there. It's like I said, it, it's very interesting that all of a sudden everyone is like pushing Shuji Kondo. Which I'm fine with because he's still no, great. He, he's still great. Wow. He's still great. It's just, yeah. <laughs> Curious. And then next up, yes, definitely. It's just a weird coincidence. Next up, uh, Rene Dupree, Hijo Del, Dr. Wagner Jr., Simon Gotch, Stallion Rogers, and Anthony Green defeated Kazushi Sakuraba, Masaki Mochizuki, Shuhei Tanaguchi, Daki Inaba, and Kinya Okada in 1329 with the walking, talking, flying, which is like a big, giant, diving body press uh, from Green on Okada. Um, yeah, this is good. Um the whole point was to sort of get the some of the foreigners over and everything like that. Paul, did you watch the show with the Stallion Rogers versus Anthony Green match? Uh, I actually did not because that was during a time when I was in the Netherlands and I was busy with other Yeah, stuff. I never got around to it because everything just got real busy. 
Uh, so I didn't. So I don't know. I haven't really seen Green in his single stuff, but I mean, I've heard I like high some of the praise stuff. for that match, to be honest. Yes, and I mean, I have liked Green. What I've seen of him on the U.S. Indies, I never watched him in NXT. He was never an NXT guy, um, even before 2.0. Um, but I don't know. I just didn't wasn't sure that he would necessarily be able to hang in Noah. But it seems like management likes him, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but you know, another just like a ten man tag sort of setup. Yeah. It was good. No, I think Green um, always has been like a really really solid guy. Uh, I've, I mean, I've watched like quite a bit of his stuff on the Indies. I mean, he's never been someone that has like blown me away, but he's also never like he like I would say he doesn't have a super high ceiling, but like his flow is also like his floor is also like pretty high as well. So like you're never gonna get a horrible performance from him. You might not really get like five star performances out of him either, but like it's definitely like he's someone that you can put in there with pretty much anyone and like you're gonna get like a competent match out of it yeah next up we had uh eta and kotaro suzuki uh defeating yoshinari ogawa and yuya sasumu in five minutes and 38 seconds when um eta made uh ogawa submit to the numero uno after they took off the um like the turnbuckle pads and threw ogawa into them a couple of times uh this was really just an angle although i feel like well, we don't know if Nosawa is still booking, but I feel like a couple of months ago this would have been a no contest, but we actually got to finish here. Yeah, I mean, this was like obviously this match was changed because Chris Ridgeway had visa is- issues because this was supposed mm-hmm. to be a junior tag title match. Yeah, but he hasn't been stripped of the title. No. Well, I mean, I guess they might be a bit more lenient when it's literally like, like <laughs> he literally can't get in the country. Like, what are you going to do? Yeah. Um, like, he can't even return the belt, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Oh, that's yeah. true, yeah. So, yeah, it was just like, as you said, it was more of an angle rather than a match because they obviously want to save that for whenever they actually can get Rich Ray into the country and run the actual match. So really was yeah, just I, a way to further that feud. I'm quite glad that they didn't strip Ridgeway because I think him and Ogawa had that great match when they won the titles. So I was really looking forward to this uh against uh, Aita and uh, uh, Suzuki. It makes me a little so. hopeful as well that they were going to retain here. Because, like, if yeah. Aita and Suzuki were supposed to win, then they might have just run with, like, stripping Ogawa and just made this the decision match. Right, right, right. That makes sense. The next up, we had Ninja Mac defeated Dante Leon in 14 minutes in 24 seconds with the Ninja Bomb. Well, uh, Ninja Mac looked good. Uh, that's all I have to say about this match. Uh, Leon is very indie, and the only I will give him credit that shooting star press cutter looked cool, but nothing else. It's did. literally all he can like. It's literally all he can do is do cutters. Just bad. He, like that's just like he just doesn't belong. Uh, just from like all aspects, like look wise, he doesn't belong. Rest like in ring wise, he just doesn't. Well, belong. wait a second. This is look at have take a look at some of those Noah Juniors. Paul. No, Can you no, really no, no, yeah, no, obviously, like because bad. the one that most obviously to me immediately came to mind, like when like Yohei came into the promotion like years ago, and it also very much felt like he didn't necessarily belong. But like at that time, at the very least, like the promotion was also like probably at its lowest point, and he has worked hard since then to like improve himself both in ring and look wise as well whereas now this is a major promotion with major backing running Budokan if like the Yohei from five years had come in like into Budokan I would have made the same point and I also don't think that Dante Leon has the potential to go down the same route that Yohei has like I think he's just kind of a bomb because at least Yohei was always like well maybe not really a body guy but at least he was like in an athlete shape Whereas Dante Leon needs to wear like a fucking baggy T-shirt because he hasn't seen a gym in six months. Well, what do you think of uh, Yohei's hair on this show? Oh, Yohei's hair on this show? Uh, it was a choice. Let's put it that way. But <laughs> yeah, he's regressing <laughs> in a way. But like, no. But like Dante Leon. I mean, the other thing with Dante Leon as well is like, what I will just tell him is like, dude, don't touch your eye after you had dropped into the toilet. Like, it's not a good look. <laughs> <laughs> and uh well Jushin Thunder Liger was on commentary and he looked like he was enjoying himself. 
kind of, I don't know if that reframes my opinion of Dusan van der Leyen. <laughs> 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 but look, I mean, maybe if you've never, like, uh, that might also be a thing that Liger just doesn't, or I doubt Liger watches GCW, that would, again, also rephrase my opinion of Dusan van der Leyen, to be honest. No, <laughs> Sanjiro Takagi watches GCW. Yeah, well, that makes absolute sense. That does not surprise me in the slightest. Um, but, and that also really fits fits him really well. Uh, but, I mean, this is really the exact type of match I don't want Ninja Mac to have a Noah, because he can just have this match anywhere. Whereas I think, like, what he did on his first run, I liked that a lot more when they put him in there against Kaito and they put him in there with Marufuji. Like, really guys that he can learn from, because one thing is never in doubt, and that is Ninja Mac's athleticism. What he does really is a guy that needs to learn proper match structure. And obviously that's not going to happen against fucking Dante Leon. So I just really hope that this was just like, this was basically just like a thing that maybe he asked for, where he's like, hey, can you bring in my buddy for Budokan and we can like have a match then show what he can do and maybe you can bring him in as well. And then now that after they've done that, they can like put him on like a proper path in there and have him work with guys like Ogawa or Kotaro Suzuki, like, and just really like or Shuji Kondo and just really like get him in there with like veterans that can like teach him like how to work a proper match and then how to combine it with his athleticism and then he can like because I would expect him to go for the junior title eventually right just given how over he is uh, Ninja Back s- said he would on commentary yeah which again makes perfect sense like that will happen eventually so and hopefully by the time he gets there like he can like work a really good match and I think in that case like he could have like a really strong title reign but like he's I not going to be able to like get to that stage if he like keeps working against like bumps like this right right definitely um next up hardcore match team ECW they weren't billed as that but I'm that's what I'm calling them Rob Van Dam and Masato Tanaka defeated Nosaro Ranga and Super Crazy in 10 minutes and 46 seconds when Van Dam hit the five-star frog splash on Nosawa and never has a man been so happy to do a job in a match. <laughs> um, you know what? This was kept pretty short, all things considered. I liked it for what it was. I went like three and a quarter, you know, star rating. They didn't reinvent the wheel. They like went right to the weapons. Like, I think it was only a couple minutes in when like Tanaka did the, the dive off the top rope through the table on the outside and once again, RVD, you know, he looks a little slower, but he still managed to pull off all of his classic moves like the frog splash and the rolling thunder and the spinning kick off the apron well enough. And, you know, Tanaka looked happy to be there teaming with Van Dam. So, you know, it it was definitely not an embarrassing match by any means. Yeah, I mean, I didn't like this match, but I've also consistently talked about the fact that I, this is, I just do not like this type of match. I never have. I never will. It's just right. not. Fun. Well, there's a ceiling on it for me too, but I mean, what you know? No, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, Van Dam was fine. Um, I mean, especially like given his age and like how he has looked and like, like, previous runs and other promotions. Like, it definitely seems like he wants to work a lot harder than Noah than he has had for years. So I think, and obviously, like, there is a spot for this. Like, I'm never going to be interested in this. But if it does actually help them draw, or if it does actually help them get a few more additional eye, like like eyes on them, then like go ahead. If you keep it like in a spot like this on the card, like then that's perfectly fine by me. It's just never going to be something that I'm going to be interested in. RVD has a little bit of that thing that Hulk Hogan and Carl Anderson has, where they'll uh, turn it up in Japan. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. But I mean, has he even had that in the past? Because I've don't really think he's really had that many memorable runs in Japan. No, he was just a mid-carder in all Japan in the 90s. Yeah, exactly. But no, it is definitely curious to see that. But like, he understands yeah. you have to like try and Japan. Yeah. To be fair, I mean, serious. like not to like besmirch impact too much, but there is still a difference between like working like, I don't know, wherever, you, wherever like impact actually like tapes their shows now and like yeah. working Budokan. Like you just like just simply being in that venue, I think motivates you to like try a little bit harder as well. 
So I think if they just keep what they're doing and just bring in like Van Damme for these like really big shows, then they're probably going to keep like a motivated Rob Van Damme. Whereas if they like tell Van Damme to come and run a show or to like come to a show at like Yokohama Radiant Hall, we're probably not going to get this level of effort. <laughs> but if he just keeps coming yeah, back exactly. for like Budokans, then I think this is the Van Damme that we're going to see and I'm fine with that. And then Goshi Ozaki, Takashi Sugira, Kazuyuki Fujita defeated Masakatsu Funaki, Katsuhiko Nakajima, and Manabu Soya in 12 minutes and 59 seconds with the power bomb from Fujita against Soya. Fujita's sort of slow climb back up the card it continues. I thought this was a good little hard hitting match, but like, you know, nothing particularly noteworthy. I actually half expected after, this, uh, after the finish of this match that Fujita was going to come out after the main event and challenge. Luckily, that did not happen. Um, yeah, as I said, it was good for what it was. It was like a nice, hard-hitting match. Uh, yep, just a really good six-man tag match. Uh, was interesting to see, though, to see Shiozaki team with the Segura gun guys. I don't really think he's done that in the past. No. But I guess it was just kind of a way to kind of get all of these guys onto the card because they're kind of just Going spinning their wheels. Like yeah, well, Go and Fujita had a bit of an awkward-looking handshake at the end yeah. <laughs> after the match. So, um, and then, ooh, the big one: Pro Wrestling Love Forever won the final countdown. Kaito Kiyomiya defeated Keiji Muto in 26 minutes and 28 seconds with the figure four leg lock. Can you repeat that real quick? I think I just misheard you a little bit there. Uh, Kaito Kiyomiya defeated Keiji Muto in 26 minutes and 28 seconds with the figure four. Are you sure you didn't get that the wrong way around? No, I, I'm pretty sure that's the correct result. Ah, interesting. <laughs> I know. Yeah, and also not really what people were expecting as well. I mean, we ran a poll on Twitter as well and we got like, what was it, like 61% <laughs> of people saying that Muda was going to win? I think it was a little higher than that. It was like about around two-thirds. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> and there was like 50 votes. Okay, yeah, yeah. so, <laughs> yeah. Unexpected, I would say. At least by some yeah. people. Well, I mean, I I sort of made the prediction last episode just because everyone else was picking Mudo, so I will take a small victory lap for that. But I mean, really, I mean, it, I don't know. I don't think it means as much because it's part of the retirement countdown. Yeah, because let's be honest, this match isn't happening unless Mudo had announced his retirement. Yeah, and they probably made him do it. Yeah, no, and that's why I also don't feel like this is actually really part of a story because, like, like the only reason this happened is because he announced his retirement. Like, I don't think this match happens and the show otherwise. So, I'm wondering with the number at this show, do any of Mudo's other retirement matches other than the final one draw? Now, I think a Tanahashi match would. But I just don't think putting Mudo in, like, random matches is and just calling him a part of the countdown is going to draw unless it's the final one or it's against Tanahashi. Yeah, because, I mean, especially because it's also in Tokyo. Like, this isn't going to be, like, Muto's last match in Tokyo. Right. So, like, I think maybe if you advertise it as being, like, oh, this is Muto's last match in Osaka, people are going to come for that, but they're not going to be, for like, sure. oh, this is the first match of his retirement tour, but... Like, it's clearly going to end in Tokyo, right? Yeah. Well, presumably. I mean, very likely. I mean, like, it's really... Will it even end in... Will his final match even be in a Noah ring? No one knows. No. I mean, for all we know, this yeah. might have been his final match, because who knows with his body. Well, I mean, he... Well, okay, so we'll get into the match. I thought this was an all-time carry performance from Kaito. Yeah. Agreed. Like, just incredible. Holy shit. Like, we're talking like, you know, like, you know, people would say back in like the 80s, like Ric Flair could carry a broom to like a great match and stuff like that. This was uh, Kaido here. And as a result, this might have been, with the exception of the match against Go, Mudo's, and I think it was better than the match against Go, Mudo's best match in Noah. I, uh, yeah, I think, I think I'm going to agree with that, yeah. I actually, um, I actually liked his match against. Uh, I actually liked his man match against uh, what's his face uh, against uh, Go as well, where he won the title. I think I'm one of the yeah, few that people that liked that one. No, I think a lot of people did. Yeah. I liked it. 
but yeah, I think this was so much better because yeah, this was as I said, this was an all-time performance by Kaito Kiyomiya with just like literally Moto spent like what like eighty ninety percent of the match lying in the middle of the ring, and then Kaito was just bumping around him like an absolute madman, just like the whole thing, like the the story that they built that he built there with the dragon screw like leg whips, like him blocking them. I think mm-hmm. that was really really well well done. Uh, now, yeah. do you think Kaito? looks a, like a bit of a chump because he had to emulate Mudo to beat him with the Shining Wizards and the figure four and everything? Uh, not necessarily, no. I think... I don't know. I don't really mind that part of the whole thing, to be honest. Because I actually don't really mind the whole character change. Because in a way that's like one of the few things I think that's kind of helped them in this is because uh, I think previously his issue was that his gimmick was too similar to Goshi Ozaki, I think was the issue because they basically were, they basically had the same gimmick. Right. They basically had the same gimmick well, that like I'm Noah, I'm wearing, I'm representing the green and all of that. So Kaido was a little more Misawa yeah. and Go more Kobashi. But, but still like I think it was still like too much of like the same and I think it's kind of helped Kaito a little bit to like become more his own man as well kind of going through this look like I was critical of it at first but like the longer it's gone on I've actually liked it a lot more that he's undergone this kind of change I think it's also helped him that he's dropped this fucking gigantic green coat that he had before because it made him look like a child (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like as well yeah, going to the black hair part. I think has helped them too so I don't didn't yeah, really sure. mind that part yeah he looks a little more edgier I guess yeah to say. Like he's getting older yeah less of a wide eyed yeah exactly like because that, I think that's really the thing for me and I think that's I don't want to know if I want to get into my overall thoughts of the feud right now but it's I don't think it well let's, let's go to this let's go to this because you put it in the uh, run sheet uh, comparison of uh, Okada versus Tenru. Yeah, because so for me the thing is as well is because that's the thing that I was reminded of when I was watching this because I think one of the kind of moments for Okada as well was like when he had that match with Tenryu where he just let Tenryu just be, let, like he just let Tenryu beat the absolute shit out of him in Tenryu's retirement match because they tried to kind of have a normal match and then Okada realized like very quickly at like oh no this guy can't go okay what am i gonna do okay i'm just gonna let this old man just beat me up and then i'm gonna beat him in the end but before that i'm gonna let him like dominate me and i think that was really like a moment where like okada kind of came into his own i don't necessarily think that it was really that much of a comparable moment for kaito but it was definitely similar in a way where it's like, okay, I, like Kaito basically had to figure out a way to kind of get a match out of someone that realistically probably has to spend most of the match on the ground because yeah. he has no knees and he has no hip on top of it, so he can't bump. So, yeah, and so like that's why that was like a similar performance to me where it's just you're the still kind of relatively young guy that's really high expectations on you and you're in there with an all-time legend. And I think that's really what both Tenryu and Muto are, like the all-time legends. And you don't want to embarrass them as well be- just because they're like older. So you have to find a way to kind of preserve their dignity within the match, but you also still have to find a way where like you have to like win the match as well. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Perfect sense, definitely. I think we'll definitely look back. Like, so I'll sort of segue into the let's talk about the feud as a whole. I think we'll definitely look back in in Kaito, like you know when he really sort of. Well, I mean, I've been saying that he's one of the best wrestlers in the world, but I mean, I think this sort of further solidified it right now, just being able to get a match like he did out of Mudo. Um, now, like. I don't really even have that much to say as a few of the whole. It was a stupid idea. 
And with Mudo's condition when he came into Noah, it was always a big risk to try to have this dragged out feud because his health was going to was never like something that you could rely on. So they waited too long and then Mudo got injured and had to retire. I don't think it ever killed Kaito dead, but I think it didn't help him. And I think the real question is I think Kaito's getting his belt in twenty twenty three. Yeah. And quite possibly on January first. Yeah. And so I think then we'll really know what this did for him or didn't do. Yeah, I I think that's kind of the thing for me and that's why this whole thing is just kind of very frustrating. And I just touched on it earlier. I don't think this mattered at all. I don't think. When we look back at the end of Kaido's career, like, this isn't, like, in, like, 20 years, like, 20 years of probably being, like, he's not going to retire at, like, 45 or whatever. Uh, but <laughs> if you look back on, like, Kaido's career and like, I don't know, like, 30, 40 years, Jesus. Um, like, we're not, this is not going to be like one of the main things that we're going to talk about there. We're not going to talk about this feud. We're not going to talk about this match as like the moment that Kaito really like emerged as the ace. Like maybe we're going to mention it as a side note, but I very much doubt that this is even going to have a chance of like breaking the top 10 all times Kaito Kiyomiya feuds when everything is said and done. No, like this no, is no. really just like it was just a waste of time for everyone. Like I don't think it hurt. Like because there's definitely like there was just like it just dominated. It just dominated the entire discourse about this promotion for an entire fucking year, and in the end of the day, it <laughs> didn't matter. Like there were so many people that were like saying, "Oh, this is the greatest thing ever to happen to Kaito Kiyomiya, and it's gonna like launch him in a stratosphere," and it didn't. But there were, on the other hand, were people that were kind of like pearl clutching and being like, "Oh, Kaito Kiyomiya is ruined, and he's never gonna be a star." And no, he very clearly is still a star, and he's still gonna be at the top of like Noah. So like that also didn't happen either. Instead, it's just like Kaito spinning his wheels for like a year. And then at the same time, it also didn't well, do didn't anything for Muto either, either because obviously the fucking legend of Kaito, like Keiji Muto, was written long ago, and it's also like it's not going to hurt or help him either. So it's like it's just it was just a waste of time for both men. Yeah, I mean, if if Kaito had lost the first one, the second would be fine. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Uh, if if he beats him like for the GHC title, like in 2021, like I. Then I actually also would have said, like, yeah, this actually would have been something that helped Kaito. Whereas now it's just like, it's like he beat him fucking far from the top in Budokan. Like, the fuck? That doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't hurt him. It doesn't help him. It's just a thing that happened. And we're probably not going to, re- like, maybe we're going to remember it because he actually managed to make it a memorable match. But otherwise, we wouldn't remember this. Like if we like the only yeah. reason we're gonna remember this is because this is like an all time like carry job by Kaito. But like otherwise this isn't like memorable. So it's just like the one thing that I will also say is like and this is actually in my in the notes as well, because once we finish this segment on this match, we will never talk about this feud on the podcast ever again. <laughs> Because I'm got <laughs> putting a fucking moratorium on it, because I just want to move on. Because, like I said, it's just dominated. It's just taken up all the oxygen around this promotion. It's like, but what about Kaito? What about Kaito and like Keiji Muto? And it's like, it's just like, no, it's just nonstop. And it's like, no, it's over. The feud is done. We're done with this. We move on. The promotion moves on, and we're just gonna talk about Noah going forward. We're gonna talk about Keiji Muto and his retirement tour going forward. We're going to talk about Keiji Muto and the legend that he is, so like that he probably deserves to be talked about as well. So we're going to talk about that as well, but not going to talk about this nonsense anymore. All right. Well, with that, also four stars shutting... on the match. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me too. Four stars. So we're shutting the door. It's now the forbidden it's door. Forbidden... <laughs> if we ever get desperate, <laughs> <laughs> it's more talk about. Uh, Muto and Kaido feud. <laughs> the forbidden door is now closed. <laughs> we might have to talk about them again because I could see a scenario where they are like a tag team in one of these countdown matches or something. 
I mean, we can talk about that match. We don't need to talk about the feud. <laughs> we can talk about <laughs> yeah, these exactly. people. <laughs> That's fine. But we don't need to talk about what it means for the feud because the feud is over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and next, more drama, although a good match. GHC Tag Team title de- decision match. Hideki Suzuki and Timothy Thatcher defeated Masa Kitamiya and Yoshiki Inamura filling in for Michael Elgin in 20 minutes and 38 seconds when they uh there was a ref stop suzuki got the ref stop with the choke sleeper on inamura i thought this was the best match of the show it was awesome like a power of technical wizards versus these brutes and i thought the last few minutes between suzuki and inamura was awesome like go out and watch this match it's just an incredible clinic yeah no this was really great this was really all i wanted like i'm really happy that I somehow managed to talk a Hideki Suzuki, Timothy Thatcher tag team run and Noah into existence just by like pure force of all, because I think I started talking about that when they brought in Hideki and then they were starting to talk about bringing in foreigners. And I think literally the first thing I said was like, they should bring in Timothy Thatcher, put him with Hideki Suzuki and have them win the tag titles. And it's actually happened. I'm so happy. <laughs> and they're matching up really well as well. Uh, I mean, that always made sense to me because, I mean, they're pretty much just like brothers from another mother because they're basically the same wrestler, just from different countries. Uh, I think they match up really well. Uh, I think they have the potential to have really, really good title reign as well. They definitely got off to an incredible start here. I think I went four and a quarter on this one. Uh, I mean, given both men, like, they're going to be, like, pretty dominant as well. And this was just a really nice kind of mixture as well of kind of... Because you have the two technical guys and Suzuki and Thatcher. And you have the two powerhouses and Kitamiya and Inamura. And I just really enjoyed kind of seeing Thatcher as well. Just kind of, like, just really, like, wrenching in his holes. Kind of readjusting his holes as well. Like, when he's, like, doesn't feel like he has, like, the exact right position on it at a time. Like... I think he's read really, that's really something that is like very unique about him where he is just someone that just like constantly will like adjust his hold or will like go for the next hold as well if he feels like he's losing his grip so I think that came across here really well he also showed like a bit more of his brawling side as well which I think is really going to help him against like help him and Noah against some of these other guys where because he can just like do like really good like stand up stuff as well where like I'm actually kind of looking really forward to his run in the N1 because I think they put him in a pretty good block to like really show off the stuff that he can do and Hideki was really really good in this as well and I mean really just everyone was really really good in this match I think Masa as well just went all out and like did the shoot headbutt again and busted himself open again uh, yeah, just top to bottom, really, really great title match. And I would say yeah, actually an improvement over what it could have been otherwise, because I think Inamura to me is like an actual improvement. Yes, definitely. So we'll get to that. LOL, Michael Elgin. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you've probably heard by now everything. I'm not even going to bother rehashing it. Uh, even Elgin denies stealing the protein powder, although he admits to being questioned by police. So you can insert your own whatever there. Uh, you know. So Maybe he climbed Sutton's into a fridge. And... Who is that again? <laughs> Maybe. Was that Josh Bodum that got sent home from an all Japan tour for climbing into a fridge? Or was that was that Bram? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Like I can't put my hand in, in my Noah. like remember who it was exactly. Like I know they both got sent home. And I know one of them got sent home for climbing into a fridge. And I think the other one got into yes. a fight with a fan. Right. Was that Bodum that got in the fight with I I mean, remember. they're both stupid enough to do that, so. Yeah. So we are rid of Elgin and, you know, good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean we I mean we talked about it at the time as well when he came in, where it's like it's only it's really only a question of time. Yeah, I didn't expect uh, somewhat it faster because, than I thought. Yeah, somewhat faster because I and either I, expected it to happen immediately where he just gets into a fight backstage with God or something, or it was going to happen <laughs> yes, in like six right. months, but he managed to just land fucking square in the middle of that. Yeah, uh, I'm actually somewhat surprised that it wasn't 
uh, getting into a fight with someone else, Gotch would have been a good I mean, team. maybe it was. <laughs> we don't know. That's the thing. We don't know. He got yeah. questioned for something. There, I mean, there's even conflicting reports. Like, some people are saying that he tried to possibly, allegedly, steal something, but it wasn't protein powder. So, I don't know. We'll have to find out more. But he, he admits to being questioned by police, yeah. so something happened. Yeah. Right. And it's so. also, like, he also, like, like in a statement that he also didn't mention something about like oh yeah but I'm gonna be back and not because I don't like he's not gonna be back I don't think he's gonna no, ever he's gonna, gonna be, be back, back in Japan either no no because he and okay so kind of breaking it up because he said that like he wasn't charged with anything because he was gonna be detained longer if that was the case and he kind of like inferred that he got that knowledge from the arrest of Matt Seidel a few years back when he got busted right but weed. Matt Sadal had drugs exactly. which is a much bigger deal yes, than shop exactly thing. exactly so that's they probably just thing. kicked him out of the country yeah because it was probably just a minor offense but it's still gonna go into his record and they're like this isn't worth the effort just you're going like you're just going home now you're not coming back bye because we just don't want to deal with you yeah for like, sure whatever and, it actually uh, was that caused this like he's most likely essentially banned from japan now well if antonio inoki or giant baba were still around he could get him back in i mean inoki is but, technically uh, still alive well yeah but if inoki had the sort of stroke that he once did or giant because giant baba got steve williams back into the country after getting busted with bad drugs thing. Yeah, at he got narita fucking... yeah he, he was banned for a, he was banned from japan from a year and then he came back Again, you have to remember that they banned Paul McCartney for 50 years and Giant Baba managed to make he, he Steve managed... Williams back into the country. He was like high on like... McCartney has returned, but it was a long time. Yeah. 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 And Baba possibly also had stroke to cover up David Von Erich's some details of his death. Oh, really? Well, yeah, like the autopsy would have been death certificate reports, you know. Ah, oh, yeah. Okay. There's like who else would have had the no, sway obviously, to, yeah, that's no questions yeah, asked, right? But I mean, there, I long story short, going back over the evidence that people were talking about after like sort of uh looking back on his on his death after I think it was the 35 year anniversary uh a couple years ago, it sounded like that guy was really sick and it wasn't probably the drugs, even though Bruiser Brody claimed he flushed some drugs in the toilet. But let's just say the smoothness is whatever it's very suspicious that you know yeah something's happened on the death certificate and that could only mean baba yeah, yeah where he wanted to save the promotion basically yeah or save face or whatever yeah, yeah. and uh i think there's others cases of people getting in the country like there's definitely people who had like criminal records that have were brought in to new japan and all japan during the glory years oh yeah i mean mvp had a new japan run yeah. And, like, oh, that's MVP right. He was in prison, well, right? He was, yes. And uh, Bam Bam Bigelow was in prison in Mexico. Oh, yeah, that's true. And he, he that didn't have an issue. So it can be done, but I feel like... But none, but none of those... But neither of them, like, committed a crime in Japan. I think that's yeah, really exactly the key that. thing here. Because yeah, that will just sure. get, get you insta-banned pretty much forever and even if it's just like a small thing like yeah you're not gonna get like a big police investigation because they're probably like it's too much of a minor thing but also you've a you've kind of embarrassed the comp because noah had to vouch for him like noah had to vouch for him to get him a visa so it's like egg on the face for noah as well so like yeah. i have a feeling that obviously like because japan is just so much of like a saving face culture like neither Noah nor the police or anyone else is gonna make like a big deal out of this. They're just gonna like quietly, like they'd rather just quietly send Elgin home and just never book him again, never mention him again. Yeah, and that's and his, just, that's, that's his that's punishment. It. Yeah, he's he's done. Yeah, no one in Japan's gonna book him. No, not even the sleaziest. Maybe, I mean, if he can even get back in. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think anyone's gonna book him. No. Maybe Almeida would if he had like money or something I mean, maybe like that. But that's big Japan it. would. But also they can't afford him yeah. either. No, exactly. And uh, he's probably only got Mexico and like Indies and Poland left that he can do. Yeah, so he can go team with Marty Skrull. Yeah, exactly. Oh yeah, also by the way, this is maybe like another thing as well, I'm just looking at these foreigners. If you wanna, if Noah just wants to bring in like a big foreigner with the name Mike, they just need to bring in like someone like Mike DiVecchio. Because I actually saw him yesterday at a show here in Berlin have like a 
straight up four star match. So, you know, if no one needs another like big foreign named Mike, that's the guy to go to. All right. And then so we go to the GHC junior heavyweight title. Hayata defeated Seki Yoshioka in 20 minutes and 45 seconds with a headache. I don't know. This is another 20 minute Hayata match. Yoshioka looked great. And I thought there were points in the match where he was on offense that the match was pretty good, but then it got filled in with Hayata stuff and the match, you know, and his reign continues. Although Kondo came out to uh, challenge him after the match, and I hope he squashes him and wins the title. <laughs> I should just squash him. Because yeah. I could see it, because he pinned Harada, right? So that's something yeah. right there. Yeah, yeah. no, 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 definitely. Uh, given that he pinned Harada, I could definitely see him end this reign, because, like, what, what's the point in keeping it on Hayata? Because he just had this, like, super long, like, yeah, I think you actually talked about this on, like, the last show as well that I missed, but Dylan Fox ably filled in for me. I uh, want to thank Dylan as well for like filling in. Uh, but talked about it then as well. Like Hayata just had this like super long reign and then he loses the belt, but then he just like wins it back pretty much right away. And it's just like, like, what are we doing here? Like, like what's the plan with the title? Like, why is it just on this one guy all the time that isn't really very compelling either? So I hope that the junior division soon will just kind of move on from just like nonstop, like Hayata, like singles, singles reigns. I was actually kind of hoping that Yoshioka was going to win here because he won the tour title at Budokan uh, like before. So I thought maybe they were just going to like redo that this time. And they didn't, unfortunately. Yeah, otherwise it was, well, it was a Hayata match, so... Like, if you've seen one Hayata match, you've pretty much seen every other Hayata match as well. But, I mean, Yoshioka is absolutely good enough to be the oh, champion. Yes, no, he absolutely yeah. should have beaten him. He absolutely should get a lengthy reign. Because, again, that one title reign that he had was also he lost the title right away. Yep. So, like, to me, like, I, like if I was booking Noah, I would just, like, put the title on Seiki Yoshioka and just have him, like, have him run with the title for, like, half a year. For sure. And now... The main event, the GHC Heavyweight Championship. Keno defeated Satoshi Kojima in 28 minutes and 17 seconds with the Moonsault double knee attack. And so we had two zero defense reigns come to an end in a row. But Keno, who felt really hot going into this match, won. It was the right decision. Um, I actually wonder if Keno winning now has anything to do with the fact that Mudo had to retire because then they can't, you know couldn't keep Mudo in the title division, but we'll, I guess we'll never know that. And the match itself, it was pretty good. Like one of the four stars, it was really hard hitting. I think they gave a lot to Kojima sort of to um, make him look respectable and, and hard fought in defeat. And really sort of watching a lot of Nagata and Akiyama and Kojima lately, he is by far in a way like the best of that generation still going. I think it's just yeah. in terms of his overall ability in the ring. Yeah, no, he's still really, really good. Uh, I mean, I really liked the show up until this match, and so I was like, okay, let's see how this is going to go. Like, I expected to like really like this match, and I ended up really liking the match. I was just going to be, like, not very happy when, like, Kojima was going to beat Keno, because, yeah, I agree that Keno is just, like, really hot, and he just feels like the guy that he should go with. But, and I really thought that Kojima was going to win, and Till Kojima came out, because to me Kojima kind of had like a major case of Sasha Banks boo boo face <laughs> when he came out, because normally he's just kind of more of like a all smiles guy, and he was just kind of really just coming out there like just with really like puffy cheeks, like he looked very really weird. Like I don't know, like I kind of so, struggling to describe it. Do you think that Kojima was told that he was getting a longer reign originally? Maybe, yeah. That's Because I yeah. can't believe Kojima has a problem doing a job like, you know, normally. Yeah, I mean, that point. that's kind of the feeling that I got that maybe they were like, oh yeah, we're gonna like have you hold the title until like, I don't know. Like, and you're gonna drop it to Mudo. Yeah, and like Ariaki Ariaki Ariake Coliseum. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then now they're gonna go like, no, Mudo's retiring. Actually, you're dropping it to Kano. But again, like all that aside, like I thought the match was really good. I also went four stars on it, and uh, putting it on Keno is just like it's the absolute right decision. 
Like Kano is yes. just a hot gun. Like he's, he's the peaking. least damaged person. He's, pe- he's also peaking right now. He's at that well, perfect yeah. age. He's 37. Uh, like his like he just has that perfect blend of character, promos, look, in ring ability. Like it's all coming together for him right now. Like it's the perfect time for him to hold that title and. I really hope it's gonna be like a really like meaningful long reign as well. Um, yeah, I I see a scenario like I was looking at the schedule. There's a big show I can't remember where it is after the N1 where he would presumably defend it against the N1 winner, and then there's the Ariaki Coliseum show. Like, I don't think, especially given like how their feud has gone recently. I don't think Kaido winning it at Budokan on January 1st yes, is the worst yes, idea. Yes, yes, That's literally what I was thinking as well. Because it fits perfect. Like, because he just... Like, Kaido just lost to Kano at the Budokan in the Several national title. Several times in a row. Yeah, but just this year, like, he lost to him in the national title match. Like, he got knocked out yeah. by Kano uh, at the beginning of the year. So I think that's just the perfect story, like, long-term story to tell. It's like you run that match back at an even higher sp- slot on the card and that's when Kaito finally wins the title back and then 2023 is just the year of Kaito Kiyomiya so I just hope that that's the plan that they have now going forward where Kano just holds the belt for the rest of the year and then drops it to Kaito because to me that's the best story that they can tell right now for sure and so there was obviously no challenger coming out to challenge Kano because we had the N1 uh, block announcements the following day after the show. So in block A, it, this year it's two blocks of eight men. So A block or block A, Keno, the 2019 winner and the 2017 Global League winner. Kazuki Fujita, second N1. Go Shiozaki, third N1. Masato Tanaka, second N1. Masaki Mochizuki, fourth N1. Hideki Suzuki, debut. Anthony Green, who's clearly filling in for yes. Mike Algan. yes. And because uh, Green was on commentary saying he wanted to go after the junior title. Yeah, he's just, he was talking in depth about like how he was going to like face Hayata. Yeah. And then the next day it's like, oh, actually, you're in our heavyweight tournament. <laughs> it's like, okay, interesting. Well, cheers to him. Like he, this is like a, a Chase Owens moment. Oh, yeah, where they right? needed someone to fill in last minute. And it's just like, yeah, I, yeah. I'll do it. And then the office forever loved Chase Owens, regardless of what everyone else may think of Chase Owens. Like, I, uh, like now. nothing ever. Like, I don't think anything has ever like been said about Anthony Green. He seems like a stand-up guy, so I hope that in this case he's just the good Chase Owens. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's already a better worker than Chase Owens. Yes, I have no, yes, uh, that, that's for sure. Uh, probably. Now, do you think that they Noah will license Heaven as a place on Earth for the N1 tournament? They should. I would like, I mean, maybe, but I don't know if they're going to go that far for him just yet. So we'll see. Well, yeah. If he becomes a big star, they should. They, yes, they yes. Should. Then they might do it. And then, like, I don't know, he has like a big match at Budokan and he comes out to that. That would actually be a really cool moment. Um, and so, uh, now, are you, is it interesting that this isn't Gotch or do you think he just had other commitments? Yeah, I think it might, for Gotch, it might have legitimately just been a thing where like his visa actually ended and he just is going back. I do expect or, Gotch yeah, to be back. Because I, I think it's just with the way visas are, and we're going to talk about someone else later where we don't think that person is the guy that fills in for Elgin. Just with the way visas are right now, like, they probably couldn't just, like, quickly re- like give him a longer visa and keep him around because I would assume that maybe they would have preferred him. Just a gut well, how long is Well, how long has Al- Alhio del Dr. Wagner been around for? Because he's been here in yeah. Noah for like months now but maybe he just had a longer like I don't remember the graph maybe yeah yeah like because I do remember there was the graph that originally like how long the visas were for everyone so yeah I'm also not sure like if he somehow got a visa extension but it might also just have been that his visa was just longer than anyone else's because again for example Rene Dupree isn't in this either right well his wife is Japanese so I don't know what that is all about oh well oh really oh okay that yeah oh so he's another one like he's the same situation as quiet storm where he actually has no issues getting a visa 
Okay, then he might oh, just yeah. want to go back to North America rather than working the N1, I guess. Well, again, we didn't really need Rene Dupree in this team. No, but I... you also needed someone to like fill in on short notice. So That's true, too. But he did it. Yeah. And so that's going to forever put Green in the good books yeah. that you oh, are, I'm sure. Definitely. Unless he just completely shits mm -hmm. the bed in, in the tournament, yeah. but I don't expect that to happen. Like, I think he, he has a chance to, like, like, because he's in there with some really good workers, so... Now, I wonder, poor Green, like, ever think he'd be in the ring with Kazuyuki Fujita and what that would entail? Oh, both Fujita and Suzuki are going to eat him up. Like, I fully expect Well, that. I think Suzuki might be a bit of more of a profession towards some of the foreigners sometimes. Sure. But... What if they cross paths in NXT? They would at the same time. Because Green would have, I think, got released in, like, summer 2021. Um, Let me take a look at it again, like... It's there were so many people in and out at that time. It's actually it was actually kind of yeah. hard to keep. So green career. Da, da, da. Where is this NXT stuff? Oh, that WWE. His last match was on the twenty second of March, twenty twenty one. I think. I think he got it released though in the summer. Yeah, so, but that is after, like, Hachiman officially arrived, and... Oh, really? I would okay. say so, because Jiro is already... Because, like, his second-to-last match was actually an attack match again, with tagging with Jiro. And I'm pretty <laughs> sure Jiro and Suzuki arrived around the same time. Because that's when they managed to get all of the Japanese people in, like, because that's when, like, yeah. Suri came in, that's when Suzuki came in, and Jiro came in. And somehow Jiro and Sare are still there. I don't know. I mean, somehow. one of them, I'm fine still being there. And stayed up forever <laughs> yes. for like uh, doing mukbangs or whatever the fuck. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, Hiro Dr. Wagner, he's in his second N1. So Block B, Masukatsu Funaki, second N1. Kaito Kiyomiya, third N1. And also the 2018 Global League winner, Katsuhiko Nakajima, winner 2021-2020. Takashi Sugera, 4th and 1, and he was a winner of the 2014 Global League. Masa Kitamiya, 4th and 1. Satoshi Kojima, N1 debut, but he was in the Global League twice. Timothy Thatcher, N1 debut. Jack Morris. Have you ever seen Jack Morris? No, I also was completely no. baffled by like who this is. And I saw some people... I mean, he's got like a WWE-ish look. Yeah, he, but that's he looks kind of generic. Like From what I've heard from some of the people, it seems that he has some talent like it's not like like i don't think it's going to be like an embarrassment but i've also never ever seen him so i can't really say anything about him i saw some people speculate that this guy is who, like that he's filling in for elgin but there's no way that can work out timeline wise no for visa. no absolutely not no definitely not so this was um, always the plan to put him in here oh for sure and they're they're high on bringing in new foreigners and trying them out at least i'm just curious what so the connection far. is uh like a like like who a scout like some like guy who's with the one, good like, looks who's the one that so i'm looking at it like he's never been in the ring would with thatcher Ray. know him because Thatcher did a lot of time in the uk yeah but i don't think thatcher really ever spent in Wait, uh, the, oh no, okay, no, that's no, okay, no, that's not Thatcher at all because he's mainly working like ICW. He was once yeah. in a match against Thatcher's cabinet, and he was <laughs> in the 30 man square go at the same time as Thatcher, right? But I don't think they've ever crossed paths really otherwise. I don't know, I would need to look through, but that also it does it really work because he started in 2017, I guess, maybe. They could have yeah such a mystery i don't know yeah I'm, I'm not sure who really is like the guy that like recommended this guy to noah yeah and so uh looking from the schedule it looks like they're going to do eight like eight matches on a show so that will be all the participants on every show wrestling which is a format that i like i kind of get why the g1 moved away from that but i do like the fact that it's just everyone is working every night and it's just and i'm not sure is it just the straight finals or is it like the top two finishers it 
in the semis. I'm trying to remember how they did it last year. Last year it was just straight up to the finals, right? It was, no, it was four blocks. Oh, last year it was four blocks. Yeah, that's true. Because Mudo couldn't work out. Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's why people suspected anyway. Um, let me just look at the recent N ones. Oh, they did it there. So in the 2021. You know, in the 2021, I think they just had straight blocks and then to the finals, I think. Okay. That's what I sort of figured out. And they're doing the finals at Osaka Prefectural or Edion Arena number one again. Um, yeah. Now, I'm curious, actually, so, what do you, who's going to win? So here, what I see coming out of a block. I see Fujita or Shiozaki as your top candidates to winning the block. I'm going to say go, but I don't think you can discount Fujita. And coming out of B, I'm going with either Kiyomiya, Kiyomiya or Nakajima. Because I could see, Ky like, what I can see is Go winning this because he's never won the N1 or ever won a global league. Mm -hmm. He beats... Kiyomiya or Nakajima in the finals and then loses to Keno. Yeah. In you know, like his title challenge. Well, that would make a lot of sense to me as well. Like go to me right now is the favorite as well. Uh I could see him facing off of Kaito in the final. Like I think that's very much a possibility. I could also be Nakajima. It could just be that they run back Nakajima because that also kind of continues Nakajima like a dreamer streak of like tournament finals because i actually just looked right. it up it's actually incredibly impressive like he's actually been in the finals of like n1 slash global leagues since going all the way back to 2018. Uh, so yeah i might as well keep him in there although who knows i i don't get the sense that nakajima is in the doghouse no although he's not really getting pushed right now but it could be like just other people are in the main events for the title but that, that's kind of nuts that he's been in like like five consecutive like finals for the NOAA tournament yeah. for the big NOAA tournament. Yeah. So that's why I think he's got to be uh, in the discussion, yeah. but it's to me, it's either him or Kaido. Yeah, it's either, it's either him or Kaido. Yeah. Unless they just want to like run with a match, like essentially want to do the thing that new Japan sometimes does, where they try to avoid like burning off a big match on a tournament final. I think it's a little different because like you buy a ticket for like, cause new Japan has built up like the final couple of nights of the g1 is a thing mm. right where that's that's not so much a thing in noah and there's going to be some time between i think the like the final block night and the final show so you probably want to put something big on top yeah there's actually another one that i just thought of who could actually come out of block b that makes sense if shiozaki wins block a and that's kojima because that way you can yeah that way you can have go get his win back over kojima from the cyber fight festival right right that's a good point because otherwise, yeah, I'm kind of struggling who else I could see like come out of A block. I don't think Keno is winning the block. I don't think anyone no. else in there is really like, unless they somehow still think they want to push Fujita. Well, that's the big question mark, right? And now are we going to have to sit through a bunch of Fujita 30 minute draws though? No, I don't think so. I think he's, because I think he's going to be in the mix. So I think he's probably going to win like quite a few of his matches. Like I could actually maybe see him get a winner with Fujita over Keno for to like set up a, like a later title train uh, challenge as well. I think they're doing Go versus Fujita on the first night. So get that out oh, of yeah. the way. Give Fujita the win and then, you know, Fujita can lose later or something. I don't I know. mean, I could see him lose but... to like Suzuki, like I think he's probably willing to lose to Suzuki. Yep. Can you convince him to lose Maybe. to Keno? That's the question. <laughs> Can you convince him to lose to Mochizuki, maybe? Yeah, maybe. He's not losing to Does Anthony Does he think Green. Tanaka is a garbage wrestler? Does he think Masato Tanaka is too much yeah, of a garbage wrestler? I don't think he respects thing? Tanaka. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe he respects, I mean, Funaki, maybe he's willing to lose to Wagner because he likes his dad. Maybe, I don't know. Um, and then also, like, uh, Funaki was going to have to probably do some jobs, but he's going to end up with a winning record. Uh, Funaki? Yeah. No, Funaki. 
Funaki, I could definitely see, like, a, I would expect that there's going to be a national title challenge coming out of this like, from someone. For sure. I was also going to say, I think it's probably time to take that national title yeah. off. Of him. Yeah, it, it's been going on for a while now. I, I also don't think that I also don't think that that was the plan for them to have it go this long, but then they just somehow didn't come up with an alternate oh, plan right. or come up with like someone to take the title off of him. So they just he's just been spinning his wheels forever now. Yeah, definitely. All right, uh, so we got through this in just about two hours, which is kind of surprising. But I think like you know we sort of knew what we, exactly we wanted to say about this because i've had plenty of time yeah. <laughs> to think about especially the noah budokan and the all japan cork and all let's just say if we had recorded uh, immediately after the triple crown tried to change that probably would have just been like two hours of angry ranting on that yeah definitely for sure right like i it's funny because i i had to wake up at 5 15 in the morning my time to watch the show live and i sort of regretted it after i did that, yeah, that that's understandable. but i was like it was too, I don't know, because I was on the, oh, no, he, Suwan was going to win thing, and it turned out he did, so partially my fault, I guess. Yeah, you. this is really all your fault. You <laughs> cursed all Japan. Yeah. But I got Kaito winning right. The real monkey's paw moment, in a way. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yes, Kaito, finally beats, Kaito finally beats Muto, but in exchange, Suwama wins the triple crown. <laughs> yeah. Paul, do you have any other closing thoughts? Uh, no, nothing really right now. I think I've kind of said my piece. Again, want to thank uh, Dylan for filling in last time. Uh, that was really, really nice. I think that was also a really, really nice show the both of you did there. So, yeah, that was really good. And uh, no, otherwise, just wishing everyone like a nice two weeks until we talk to you again. Yeah, um, well... In two weeks' time, I don't even think the N1 will have started, and All Japan would have just done a couple of small shows. So we might just even come back with a Mudo retrospective episode next, talking about some of uh, uh, certain periods of his career and some of the big matches from that. So you can look out for that, because it's going to be quiet until we get a little further into August. So we'll see you in about two weeks. All right, take care, everybody.